I don't know, I just had like an unsettling feeling about it. And I remember the one girl saying to me, I had braces at the time. And I remember her saying that she wished that she had braces and that I should, you know, play off of that, you know, get fake glasses and put pigtails in my hair and, you know, make myself look younger because I would make more money if I looked younger than what I was. And I was 25 at the time. So I was like, what do you mean by younger? Um, and then when I realized it was like, oh my gosh, they mean like underaged, mm. underaged girls. Um, that was very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> yeah. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful as we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Laura. Laura grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, but had a challenging childhood. She experienced childhood neglect, and from a young age, porn was normalized in her life. Her warped understanding of love led her to seek out validation for men, which eventually led to her working in the porn industry. During this conversation, we talk about her misconceptions about the porn industry, how her time in the porn industry negatively impacted her, and what she's up to today since leaving porn. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoy this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Laura, I just want to say thanks for joining us today. Of course. I think it's always good to kind of know who you are today. And so I'm wondering if you can talk to like what life looks like for you these days before we jump into your personal account. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, I grew up in a small town in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, I work full-time at a local family-owned company as a front office secretary, and I really enjoy my job. My dad and my brother also work there, so it's kind of neat that I get to see them on a daily basis. That is cool. Um, yeah, it is, because I, I wasn't close really with either of them growing up, so um, it's neat to have that extra connection with them now. And if you would have told me five years ago that I would be working um, with my dad, I never would have believed you. <laughs> oh, wow. um, yeah. So just the fact that we're able to work together and stuff is, um, is really neat, but I'm sure at some point we'll talk more about that to like contextualize what you mean by that. Right. Yeah. It's, we joke about it all the time. It's, it's funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, can we get a little bit more context as to what life was like growing up for you? Like jumping back to your childhood and adolescence yeah. Um, so I don't really remember a lot of my childhood. Um, I'm guessing it's just because I didn't really have that great of a childhood. So I blocked a lot of that out. Um, mainly my relationship with my dad was not good. I grew up watching him be very verbal and emotionally abusive towards my mom. And my siblings were, so my sister's five years younger than me and then my brother's five years younger than her. So okay. I had five years of um, my mom and my dad to myself. And I feel like those were the years that things were the worst um, just because my dad had a temper that he didn't know how to really express in a healthy manner. So it would filter out into my mom. And then as I would get, as I got older, um, it filtered out onto me then. So, um, yeah, I hate to say it, but my childhood was not that great. <laughs> well, that's, it's sad because I'm a person, you know, I believe that every kid deserves to have a healthy childhood. And, and the reality mm -hmm. is that that's just not the case because of the, of the world we live in. Like we all, we aren't all that fortunate. Right. Yeah. I was never daddy's little girl or, um, 
you know, never felt like a princess. And I think in school growing up, I kind of had um, a struggle with jealousy of girls that did have that close relationship with their dad because I didn't have that and I had no idea what that looked like. So that was hard. Yeah, I'm sure that you longed for that. Yeah. Do you want to talk to like your mother being in the picture or out of the picture? Like what was your relationship like with her during those years? Um, Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, uh, my relationship with my mom was good until I got into my teenage years. Uh, It's kind of when I really started to rebel a little bit um, because my sister and my brother were in the picture at the time. And um, I kind of felt like they didn't have, like they had a better childhood than I did because my dad at that point was at a little bit of a better place. Okay. So the things that I experienced growing up, I feel like they didn't really get to experience uh, at the same level that I did. So right. there was a lot of jealousy there. Um, so, I mean, things, my relationship with my mom wasn't bad, but I wouldn't say that it was really good either just because I had caused, um, like I had put up a wall and pushed myself away. Uh, just because of the things, the choices that I was making with the circle of friends I was involved in and the guys that I was interested in and um, just really struggled with depression and anxiety and things like that throughout my adolescence and didn't feel like my family understood that. Um, And I didn't see like my sister or my brother struggling with any of those things. And so it just kind of made me feel like an outsider in my family growing up. Shoot, that's so tough. Yeah. Whenever I hear about a person experiencing childhood neglect, um, I always have to ask them if they've read the book Running on Empty. No, I haven't. Okay. I don't know if you're interested in reading, but as a person who did experience childhood neglect, you should definitely look at that book. It's, It's called Running on Empty and it just emphasizes like how important those years are. And if Mm -hmm. the child doesn't get the connections and comfort and love that they need, it can be very, very impactful. Kind of like what you're talking about, like you were experiencing depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there is a correlation there between your experience with childhood neglect and those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough, but it's helped me also be more sensitive to, um, like younger people that I know that have gone through stuff like that. Um, because if you talk to someone that hasn't gone through things like that, they can't really relate. So, yeah. um, I mean, that's been neat to be able to speak into other people's lives that have gone through it where I've, you know, been through it and have healed from it and things like that. So, well, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. That's really, really cool. Well, I'm kind of curious, like how that relationship, or I guess lack of a relationship with your dad affected your choices as you went into your adolescence and like started dating and that those types of more romantic relationships like how did that negatively impact you in that way yeah um well since I didn't really have any kind of a standard or role model as to what um I should be looking for in a guy I kind of just attached myself to anybody that gave me attention, which obviously is never (laughs) a good thing. It doesn't end up being the good guys that you end up with when you um, go off of a system like that. Um, And I always felt like I needed to have some type of relationship with a guy in order to feel beautiful or wanted or loved. Um, I mean, I knew that my dad loved me, but I didn't feel that he did. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I can't remember a time growing up where I didn't have a boyfriend and they were never, um, like it was never anything solid. It was all superficial. So, right. At what point did, this is kind of like a, an abrupt pivot, but like at what point did you get exposed to pornography? Um, so in middle school, Um, It was kind of just like a thing. One of my girlfriends, her dad had um, a DVD of porn and we were curious and um, there's just more of like a curiosity thing. We knew people were watching it um, at that age. That's when you start talking about things and knew all the guys were watching it and didn't really think it was a big deal and just kind of exposed ourselves to it in that way. But it was just like, okay, that's it but didn't really think twice about it right? at that point. So, Just for context, like at what age did you 
for, were you first exposed, like in this scenario with the DVD and your friend? Um, I want to say it was probably eighth grade. Okay. One of the common misconceptions about pornography consumption is that it's only a guy thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always good to have people who, women who have been exposed to pornography at an early age so that Mm -hmm. we like the listeners and we as individuals in the world can understand like pornography does not discriminate. It doesn't matter what gender you are or aren't or what religion you are or aren't, or political affiliation. Like, none of those things matter. We can all be affected. Yeah, absolutely. How did that first-time exposure impact you? Um, I mean, at that point, it didn't really phase me at all. I just thought it was something that everybody was exposed to at some point in their life, and if they wanted to continue watching it. I mean, I did think it was more like a guy thing um, to, like, watch it continuously, Um, but it didn't really, I just didn't think it was a big deal. Yeah. Um, it was just, like I said, it was just out of curiosity and we were like, oh, what's, you know, all the fuss about it. And that was it really. Didn't really think anything of it past then. Right. Did your porn consumption escalate from there? Like at what point did you start turning to, did you ever, I should say, I don't want to assume, did you ever start turning to pornography, um, on a personal level? No, I did not. Okay. And the normalization of pornography, you've kind of talked to that, like how it was normalized amongst your peers and it Mm -hmm. was a thing out of curiosity. I'm just wondering, like, how that impacted you. Um, Like, did it negatively impact your, you know, self-image or your views of what healthy sex is? So... I didn't really, because my parents were really strict, so there wasn't much that I could do that I could get away with. (laughs) So I think that actually protected me a lot from scenarios that I could have gotten myself involved in Mm -hmm. um, that would not have been good, whereas all of my friends, you know, were already um, sexually active and, you know, would talk about their experiences and they would talk about, you know, oh yeah, you know, watch porn with so-and-so and and we tried this and did that. And I mean, I couldn't really because I hadn't like I wasn't involved in the same things that they were so but I did feel like in my relationships they would only go so far um because I wouldn't do those things with guys so then once they knew that they couldn't get that from me then they the relationship would be over okay how did that negatively impact you like the fact that you would have these relationships but then when the guy realized that it wasn't going to progress to sex um, like, and then they would bail, like, how did that impact you? Um, it made me feel like there was something wrong with me and it was frustrating because I felt like I was behind every one of my friends was doing it and was in these intimate relationships. And I just felt like I was missing out on something. And, um, at that point I still didn't have a great relationship with my dad. So I still didn't have that you know, male figure in my life. And it was just frustrating that I felt the only way that I could get that is if I did have sex, but I just, I don't know why I didn't, but I just, I never did until I, yeah, until I was 21 and I regret it. (laughs) It's kind of interesting because in your personal account, your personal, on a personal level, your porn consumption didn't escalate from Mm. your first time exposure, but you were negatively impacted by like porn culture it sounds like because your peers were consuming porn and they had this expectation Mm -hmm. and when, and then it uh, it negatively impacted your relationships. It sounds like. Yeah. At what point did you begin to realize that porn consumption can disrupt? Like we're talking about romantic relationships. Like at what point did you realize that pornography consumption can disrupt couple intimacy or relationship harmony? So, um, my last relationship was back in 2010, 2011, um, somewhere around that area, um, that time frame. And, um, the guy that I was dating at the time was very involved in the adult entertainment industry. Um, and it was in that relationship that I was really exposed to porn on like all levels and, um, I also got to see like the other side of 
the camera, not just what people view when they go on a website or watch like a video or a movie. Um, so he was like in production. No, he, so there, um, is an adult website community that you can create your own like member profile Mm -hmm. and you can either pay for it if you want to be a model, um, or you can just like create one and talk to the models that are on this website. Okay. And he had a profile where he would like connect with these models and like have, um, like internet relationships with them, I guess you would say. Yeah. And so he exposed or introduced me to that when we were dating. And um, that was kind of the turning point for me when I realized um, that porn is more than just two people having sex for entertainment. (laughs) Yeah. And one thing that's kind of tough about the current porn landscape, like what's currently happening today, is that is that like what you're referring to, like user generated content facilitates exploitation at an even greater level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I don't think people realize like, um, so he had encouraged me to create a profile. um, And I was a little hesitant at first because it was all new to me. But then he kept talking about it and I was reverting back to, well, if I don't do this, then I'm probably going to lose him and I don't want that to happen. Yeah. Um, so against my better judgment, I created a, a profile, a paid one. Um, so I was not like an official model, but I was still putting content up on this website for other people to see. And um, that was kind of like even just like hearing myself say that it's still hard for me to grasp that I even was involved in anything. But, um, yeah, that was kind of like my first step into seeing what really goes on behind the camera. Do you speculate that your boyfriend at the time kind of coerced you into it? Because if you look at the definition of coercion, it's to persuade using threat and you kind Mm -hmm. of, you kind of expressed just barely how like, the relationship was progressing and you kind of were scared that it would end if you didn't create a profile. Mm -hmm. Do you think he intentionally like coursed you into it? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I do think that for him it was maybe like a pride thing, like, Oh, I have a girlfriend who's, you know, a model on this website, you know, but I don't think it was like a, like a power thing. Um, I think if I wouldn't have done it, we he would have been okay. But like in my mind, because of my insecurities, I was thinking that we wouldn't be okay if I didn't. Yeah. It's almost like because of your past relationships, you had been conditioned to think that if you didn't, then it would end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when you began to realize that it can disrupt couple intimacy and relationship harmony. Did you immediately, after creating the profile, did you immediately start to realize that it was disrupting those things? Not at first. Um, It was a very slow realization um, because when I first created the profile, um, I was also curious myself because I had this preconceived notion that these girls that were involved in porn and the adult entertainment industry that they were there just because they really enjoyed having sex and that they didn't care that people um, were watching them or, you know, posting, um, you know, nude, you know, pictures um, that they were just very confident and, you know, very into their feminism. And I was curious about that um, because I struggled with self-esteem and thought, well, maybe this will help me feel more confident. Um, And then when I started making connections with these girls and actually became really good friends with two of them, I quickly realized then that that's actually not the case. Um, Pretty much every single girl that I connected with on that website was struggling with something. We want to be loyal to the absent and we don't want any, you know, specific details. Mm -hmm. But like when you say that they were struggling with something, can you be a little bit more specific? Like, was there a common trend? Was it kind of mm-hmm. similar to what you experienced where it was childhood ne- neglect of some sort or abuse? Or? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them, um, didn't have fathers growing up. 
um, or were abused physically or sexually um, by a family member or a friend or somebody else. A lot of them struggled with depression, anxiety, um, suicidal thoughts. Um, the one girl that I had become really good friends with, she had been in the hospital multiple times for trying to commit suicide. Um, so yeah, these weren't confident women like I th originally thought. <laughs> yeah, that's a common misconception. We hear people say, you know, people in the porn industry are there because they have a higher sex drive. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that wasn't your experience. Yeah, it was not. <laughs> well, going back to like the time that you create the profile, you talked about how that was surprising to you. Like you almost couldn't believe that you made the profile. Mm -hmm. What about like the first time you produced porn? How did that impact you? Like how, what was that experience like? Um, it was weird and I feel like I kind of blocked a lot of it out. So I'm going to try and, um, I guess explain it the best way that I can. I, I mean, I just remember, um, doing a lot of blog posts at first just to kind of get interaction from people. And then I would post, um, kind of, you know, like half nude, half not, I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but um, you know, and kind of like eased into it. And then, um, my ex and I had actually had a fight and I was just really emotional and just kind of went like full nude in one of my posts and wasn't really even thinking when I posted it. Right. Um, and then after it was already posted and people were commenting and I was getting reactions from people about the pictures, um, that I had shared there was kind of a like a disconnect that happened where it was like, okay, like I'm into porn now, so this is my life. Wow. So it sounds like it was almost like this emotional decision, kind of like spur of the moment emotional decision because of the fight. Yeah. Did that change anything in regards to your perspective of how you saw yourself? Um, I mean, I still never really felt confident. Um, and I don't want to necessarily say that doing that made me feel confident, but it did for like a split second, make me feel like people were seeing me. Yeah. Um, obviously not in a good way, but I was still being seen right. and, um, that's really all I was wanting and like joining that community. I thought that I would get more like attention and affection from him. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case either. So then when I was getting it from other people, that did kind of make me feel a little bit more like, okay, well, at least I'm getting attention from somewhere. Yeah. I think we can all relate to that to some degree. I mean, yeah. I, I've never produced pornography, but I think, again, any of us can relate in regards to social media. Like, mm -hmm. I bet it's common for the the typical user on social media to post something with the intention of getting attention. Right. Right. We, we kind of enjoy the likes or the comments or whatever. Yeah. And that's kind of, kind of what it was like. It was like the adult version, I guess, of Instagram. If mm. you, if you say, if you want to say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> As you continued to produce pornography, did you experience like an escalation in regards to the type of pornography you were producing or what you were comfortable with? I don't know if comfortable with is the correct terminology because it sounds like you're using coping mechanisms to repress those feelings. So I don't yeah. know if, I don't know if comfort is the right word, but yeah, no, I mean, um, not really. I just kind of, I mean, I got numb to everything really. I started drinking a lot during this time as well. I was never really like a big drinker. I mean, I would have like a beer or something here and there. Um, but like drinking was pretty, prevalent in my life at that point. And I think that kind of helped me stay distracted from like what I was doing. And, um, I guess I just didn't care at that point. So, yeah. Gotcha. Is that a common trend that you saw with other performers that you interacted with, like abusing drugs or alcohol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. And they were very, um, willing to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there was definitely a lot of drug use that was going on in a lot of the girls that I connected with. Yeah. Did you feel safe during this period of time? Um, I don't want to say that I 
felt safe or didn't feel safe. Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain because this community that I had become a part of had um, like an area where you could go on the website for members only who had paid profiles. And they were like, I guess you could call chat rooms that you could go in and talk about a specific subject and um, everybody who related would be in there. And this community had just tons and tons of chat rooms um, on girls that you could go and talk to if you were struggling with depression, um, anxiety, eating disorders, just, I mean, anything and everything. It was, they had a group for it. Yeah. And I found comfort in going to those groups and talking to these other girls about my struggles with my dad and my family and even the struggles I was having in my current relationship and my depression and all the other things that I was struggling with because I was really the those were really the only people the first time ever that I could talk about that stuff and not feel like I was being judged yeah there's these famous psychologists who created something called the humanistic perspective And it's by Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. And the humanistic perspective says that a person needs three things to become the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's genuineness, which is like openness and self-disclosure. Acceptance. Mm -hmm. So kind of like what you're saying, being accepted amongst the group. And the last one is empathy. Mm -hmm. And so I can totally understand why it was like almost like a cathartic therapeutic experience to share these things with those girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't feel alone um, for the first time in my life. And it's sad that it took me being part of a community like that to feel that. But um, yeah, I became like one of the girls I actually became really good friends with. And even when I got out of, um, you know, the adult entertainment industry, her and I still stayed close for a few years after and um, would send each other care packages and stuff because I had just developed such a heart for her yeah. Um, and for the other girls that, you know, I had connected with maybe not on like a deep level, like I did with her, but yeah, it's just, it's a sense of like family. And since I didn't feel like I had that in my actual family, like these girls in a sense were my family. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned some of the, like some of the negative impacts you talked about, Um, like eating disorders or drug abuse or depression, anxiety, those things that you could go to this place on the website to seek help. Mm -hmm. What ones specifically were you experiencing? Did you experience um, like an eating disorder or other negative things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have struggled with uh, depression and anxiety pretty much my whole life. And um, when I was in middle school and high school, struggled with an eating disorder And um, there were moments throughout my life where I struggled with uh, suicidal thoughts. So a little bit of everything. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I just want to say that I'm a big fan of endurance events, but Mm. I I look at life as like the ultimate endurance event. Yeah. And from what I know about you, I mean, we've only been talking for a short period of time, so I don't know that much, but you seem like a person that's really strong, um, Like you seem like the ultimate endurance athlete. (laughs) So you should be, you should be proud of yourself for that. Yeah, it's, it's rough, but, um, I mean, I feel like, you know, there's choices that you make and sometimes you make choices that you don't realize that you're even making that are good for you. And, um, I don't know, like, it's hard to explain because there was a moment where I was really depressed and um, I can remember it was when my ex and I were together and I was, you know, in the middle of all all this stuff and I was coming home one night and there's this bridge that's on a back road that I drive over every time I go home. And when I was approaching this bridge, like the thought of just driving my car off the side of the bridge um, was very very strong. I remember one night and I, I mean, I don't know what it was that kept me from doing it, but I know that like in my mind, like I really wanted to just end my life at that point. And I'm very glad that I didn't because of where I'm at now. But, um, it breaks my heart that I know that there are girls that 
that struggle with that stuff on a very regular basis. And, you know, people still look at them like they're just a product. So, right. Yeah. You said it best. Like they're being objectified by current consumers of pornography. And at the same time, they're feeling really, really down. Mm -hmm. And man, suicide ideation, man, those types of invasive thoughts are, are serious. And, yeah. um, and they're tough to talk about. And is it is it tough for you to talk about those things today? It kind of sounds like they are based on kind of your tonality and things. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is because, you know, life, um, like where I'm at now, I just really value <laughs> my cool. life. And I'm just, I'm so thankful um, for my life and where I'm at Well, that's so um, cool. right now. So, yeah, I mean, it is emotional to talk about. And it's emotional, too, um, like I said, because I know that there are people that are still back where I was. And um, that just, that hurts my heart. Yeah. Going back to your relationship with, you know, your former boyfriend Mm -hmm. at this time, did you being in pornography and him, was he interacting with other individuals while you guys were together? He was, yes. Very much. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious if you can talk to that a little bit. Like, how did, how was your relationship? Um, I felt like our intimacy was basically me performing for him um, because I felt like whatever he was watching or I was seeing from the other girls that I needed to reenact the same or that I needed to reenact whatever I was sharing on my page um, in our relationship when we were being intimate. And yeah, that was hard because it, nothing felt real. And it was hard for me to kind of distinguish, like, was he like even doing this because he wants to do this with me or is he just doing this just because I'm here? And, um, you know, I didn't feel like it had any meaning whatsoever right. to right. him. Yeah, there's definitely a difference between, you know, just just an orgasm and mm-hmm. an actual intimate relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's tough. At what point did you two break up? So, he had introduced me also to being a cam girl. Um, that was another thing that he really encouraged me, not in like a forceful manner, but was just kind of like, hey, like, have you thought about doing this? Since you're already doing this, you can do this and also make money. Um, so I, you know, was like, well, why, what does it matter? Like, what's the difference? I'm already doing, you know, this on, you know, so why don't I just try the, you know, the cam thing and just make some extra money on the side? Who doesn't love that, right? <laughs> so, um, it was very different from the other community that I was a part of. And I feel like I saw more, um, I don't really know how to explain it. Like I, like, I don't feel like I was, um, involved in sex trafficking at all, but I definitely feel like I saw more of grooming for sex trafficking when I was involved in the webcam, um, side of everything. And that, that was weird. Um, I didn't stay involved in that for very long, but just because it didn't sit well with me, um, it was just a very awkward experience. I don't really know how else to say it. You don't have to answer this question. So if you don't feel comfortable or if you're hesitant at all, just say no. But I'm, I'm curious if you can talk to a little bit more specifically what you mean, but when you say that you like were suspicious of sex trafficking, like what created that suspicion? Mm -hmm. So it actually wasn't until like a a couple years later, I guess when him and I weren't together, I mean, there were like, there were girls that were on there and they, you could talk to each other and then see like on the chat side, like what other people were saying. And like, if you had a profile, so I don't know if I'm explaining that where it makes sense, but like the girls, we could talk to each other while the um, users on the other side were just typing, but they couldn't see that we were talking to each other. There's like two different other. chats. Yeah if, yeah, that, if that makes sense, yeah. Um, and like I could observe like other chats where girls would like say, oh, this guy, you know, 
likes when you do this or whatever. And um, it was just very weird to me because I don't know. I just had like an unsettling feeling about it. And I remember the one girl saying to me, I had braces at the time. And I remember her saying that she wished that she had braces and that I should, you know, play off of that, you know, get fake glasses, um, put pigtails in my hair and, you know, make myself look younger because I would make more money if I looked younger than what I was. And I was 25 at the time. So I was like, what do you mean by younger? Um, and then when I realized it was like, oh my gosh, they mean like underaged, mm. underaged girls. Um, that was very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> yeah. At what point did you start to contemplate if you really wanted to participate in this industry? Um, so it was when we, when my ex and I broke up, um, I completely got rid of that the cam site I was completely done with that because he was still involved in it and um, that was actually why we ended up breaking up because I had gotten to a place where I was like you know this is actually not okay you're in a relationship with me I don't understand why you feel you need to be going on and making these other connections with these girls when I'm doing everything that you've like kind of encouraged me to do thinking that this is what you wanted yeah. and you're still going back to this stuff and confiding in these girls. And he told me I was crazy and insecure and just jealous and that there was nothing wrong with what he was doing. Um, and then we broke up. So did that act as a catalyst to you saying, Hey, I don't want to be a part of this in industry anymore or did you continue producing after that as well? No. So I, like I said, I um, gotten out of the Cam Girl um, website completely, deleted my profile, made sure all my stuff was gone. And then the other community, I was still involved in that. I didn't post stuff um, as much. That dwindled as time went on, but it was hard for me to walk away from that community completely just because of the connections that I had made with the girls. Yeah. There were two girls, especially, um, one was an actual model, um, in the community. And then the other one was, um, on her way to being one and, um, they lived in different States. So I never actually got to hang out with them in person, but I connected with them so well and we would send each other care packages and text and talk and, um, I felt like, you know, I had two people that knew what I was going through and I didn't need to feel like I needed to try and hide anything. Yeah. And especially since they knew that part of my life, because I had had other, you know, close girlfriends in my life while I was doing all of this, but none of them had no idea that I was doing it. Yeah. It's kind of cool to look back on, you know, where you were and where you are today. And we do have to navigate some heavy conversations when we're talking about this topic of course we do but there's also that hopeful side kind of like what i just acknowledge like the fact that you, like who you are today and, and that's amazing and very they're very hopeful mm -hmm. but i'm curious if looking back if there's a moment that kind of stands out as like your lowest of lows yeah um so it's definitely um the night driving up to the bridge uh, where I wanted to drive my car off into the river. Um, I was pretty low that night, and I was actually on my way home to my parents' house that evening. And um, I guess you could say I just kind of hit a breaking point. And I remember thinking to myself that if I don't get my life together and get to like a healthy place, I'm going to end up taking my life. So that was scary for me. Yeah. Were your parents or siblings aware of the situations you were in? They were not. Okay. I hit it pretty well from, I mean, my parents knew that I struggled with depression um, and anxiety and, you know, all the other stuff. Um, my mom actually still has a suicide note that I had written. Um, I don't even know how old I was when I wrote it, but she held on to it as just kind of like a, you know, thank God you're still here type of thing, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they didn't know everything that was behind a lot of 
why I was struggling yeah. um, at that specific. Like I only opened up to my mom about this part of my story maybe a year ago. Okay. And is your dad aware of what you've been through? Um, not in detail. Um, and it's hard because I love my dad so much and there has been a lot of growth and healing in our relationship. Um, more so in like the last four or five years of my life. Um, my thirties have been great. (laughs) Nice. Um, you deserve it. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just crazy how life changes when you don't expect it to. But yeah, my dad and I are on a really, we're at a really good place right now in our life. And, um, I think it's hard for me to share certain aspects of what I've been through because I don't want to hurt him. Yeah. So. As you mentioned earlier in the conversation, you mentioned the one thing that kind of hurts your heart is knowing that there's other people out there right now who are in the porn industry who feel stuck and don't know how to transition away. Mm. And... I'm wondering if you can kind of talk to like what was the most challenging thing for you as you transitioned away from pornography and started to move toward a healthier version of yourself? Um, Probably the hardest thing was coming to terms with what I was involved in. Mm. Um, For the years after I um, got out of it, I kind of just tried to erase it. Like, mm. it didn't exist. Um, nobody in my family knew. None of my close friends knew. Um, only my ex and the girls that I had connected with through the community knew that I was involved in that. Um, so I don't want to say, like, it was easy. <laughs> but it was easy for me to kind of conceal that part of my life and sweep it under the rug like it never happened because I didn't have to talk about it. Nobody ever asked me about it. Um, but then... As time went on, I felt like this was something that I needed to start sharing with people um, because there were different things that were coming out about sex trafficking. And um, like just in the last couple of years, it's it's been like more talked about in social media and things like that. And the connection between sex trafficking and porn. And that was kind of like opening an old wound. Like, I wasn't expecting that at all. And so I had to, in, like, the last couple of years, come to terms with, you know, I was involved in something that was fueling the need for trafficking, um, however you look at it. And so when I started, like, educating myself on that and, like, allowed myself to come to a place where I needed to start opening up about it to people Mm -hmm. um, that I knew cared about me, that's when like the healing really started to happen. Um, And when I started, because then I know like one of my friends I opened up to, um, she was like, oh my gosh, she's like, I never would have known. She's like, my husband and I, we've actually struggled with porn. And I mean, I never would have known that had I not (laughs) opened up and shared my experience. Um, So I think a lot of people struggle with it that you don't even realize that they do because nobody talks about it. Wow. It takes me back to what I mentioned earlier about the humanistic perspective and those three things, which is genuineness, acceptance, and empathy. And it's kind of, it sounds like you're, you saw a lot of benefit and like you started healing once you were able to be genuine and open up to a trusted someone. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That like human connection was healing. Yeah. And once I... Um, so my mom was not the first person that I shared it with. Um, she was the third, (laughs) but when I finally opened up to her, um, and was just very transparent, I mean, she knew about my friendship with the one girl, but I twisted the story to make it sound like I don't, honestly, I don't even remember how I told her I met her, (laughs) but, um, so I don't know, maybe in the back of her mind, she suspected that there was stuff going on and I just, you know, didn't acknowledge it. But when I fully like shared that part of my life with her, um, it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders and I felt 
like now I can really move on. Um, whereas before I felt like I was just putting a bandaid over something and, um, that wasn't really helping me heal from anything. Wow. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are afraid to share because they, I mean, I know for me, I was afraid that my mom was going to look at me differently. Um, or that she wouldn't understand, um, or that I would be tainted in some way. And I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I mean, for me, that was not the response that I got. I, she was very loving and compassionate and um, reminded me that, you know, your past does not define who you are today and it doesn't have to be your future. So that's so cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Fast forward to today, and I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the benefits. I mean, you've already mentioned some of them, like a better connection with your dad and like the gratitude levels being high and just enjoying life. Um, Are there any other benefits that you'd like to share now that you're living a life free from porn's influence? Yeah, um, I, for the first time in a really long time, just feel genuinely happy. Um, Like it's not something that I have to force Mm -hmm. myself to feel. Um, And I'm just grateful every single day that I have the people that I have in my life and that I have the life that I have. And like you had said earlier, um, you know, not encouraging people to go out and experience, you know, things that are going to um, cause them pain. But I really don't think that I would have the gratitude for my life that I have now had I not gone through the things that I went through then. Wow. That's kind of cool to see, like, that positive correlation between gratitude and happiness. Like, increased gratitude equals increased happiness. Yeah. That's amazing. As we come to the end of this conversation like our, our level of gratitude is high because again, like you are a big part of this movement to change the conversation about pornography. Mm -hmm. Like you are a big part of it and you're making a difference in your, your openness and the work that you've put in are not only you know, in positively impacting yourself, but also positively impacting our listeners. So we just want to say thank you. And as we come to the end of the conversation, I do want to leave you with the opportunity to have the last word during this conversation. So if there's anything else on your heart or mind that you, that you haven't shared or that you would like to highlight again, we'd love to learn from you in this way. Yeah, I mean, really, I just want people to know that um, whether they are consuming porn because it's an addiction or they're doing it casually, um, the people that they are watching are more than just entertainment. They're people. And um, I know that I only, you know, experienced a small fraction of that community, but a lot of them, I can almost guarantee you, are not the confident people that you think that they are yeah. and that a lot of these people are actually hurting. They deserve to be treated with respect. And like for the girls that are still involved in the pornography um, industry, whatever aspect it is, I just, my heart is for them whether they are there because they feel that that's all that they are good for or they're being forced into it. Um, I just, I don't know, like I just want them to know like that doesn't have to be their story. And even if things seem completely hopeless, they're not. And you just kind of have to trust yourself um, because healing is possible and it's, it's definitely worth it. So It's a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. As you were talking about, you know, seeing the person on the other side of the screen as a person, um, a quote came to my mind and I don't remember this guy's name. I think I'm just going to guess. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I think his name's Sam Carr and he's a professor. This guy, he says that sexual objectification and empathy 
cannot coexist. Like they are incompatible and it just kind of reinforces what you said. Like we should be considering the fact that these people are people and that even though it's pixelated, there is a person on the other side of the screen. So, you know, for me, like I was there because I was seeking acceptance and, um, wanted to feel something that I wasn't getting from, you know, other relationships in my life. And I mean, I'm pretty confident in saying I feel that's the majority of the reason why a lot of those girls end up um, in the same situation. So, I mean, I definitely agree. There's no way that you can have empathy for somebody, but then also support them being involved in something like that. Yeah. Well, is there any way that we can support you? Anything we can do to support you, our listeners, or us as an organization? Um, I just keep doing what you're doing. I think that your organization is amazing and I recommend it and share and, um, talk about it to anyone and everybody that I can. Um, just because I think, especially with sex trafficking and how tied in that is to pornography, I just think it's really important for people to feel a level of, um, I guess, I don't know if comfort's the right word, but it shouldn't be hard for people to talk about porn. Um, Because I think when people are afraid to talk about it, that's when things get misconstrued. And the truth doesn't get out about what it's really about. So, right, yeah. Well, I know I've said this already, but I want to state it again, and it's from a, a sincere place. Like, we would be like our organization would not exist without people like you so our level of gratitude is high yeah thanks for having me thanks for joining us on this episode of consider before consuming consider before consuming is brought to you by fight the new drug Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.